So this is what we're doing today. We're creating another tier list for decks of the past, but instead of meta decks, we're looking at pre-built decks. So these are decks with champions that are meant to go together. Very often when an expansion releases in Runeterra, you have two champions that kind of work around the same concept. And very often you can identify these decks with a single word. For example, we have Gangplank Sejuani here, that's Plunder. We have Jax Orn here, that's Forge. Kindred Nasus, that's Slay. Oh. So we're going to rate these decks by how cool and how frustrating they might have been. So the tiers we have here is fun to play, fun to play against. Pretty explanatory. Minor frustrating aspects, but cool. Means the deck overall is very fun to play against. You don't really mind it, but sometimes they have like one card or one card combo where you're like, okay, that maybe shouldn't exist. Next is annoying but playable. Well, this, the one above it, but much worse. It's like, I'd rather not play against this because they do a lot of annoying things. Surrender early to save mental. I feel for a lot of people that would be Lurk. Where it's like, okay, Lurk hit Rek'Sai on turn one or two. I guess I'm surrendering now to save my mental and just go next. Feels miserable to play against. You queue up against this deck and you instantly just don't feel like playing the match at all. Doesn't even matter if they high roll or low roll early. You just don't want to play against it because it is so frustrating. And Kill Me is just like last time, Blade Dance. I'm just going to put that one right there because we're all thinking it. We all know where this one is going to go. This one is in the Kill Me category because it ruined the game for a very long time. This was one of the pre-built decks that was just miserable to play against. Now, one thing I will say, or two things I will say, that's that that was the first thing that I wanted to say. The other thing I wanted to say is that there are some champions that okay, let's say that there are some champions that go into one deck and they're meant to be in that deck because, like for example, with Blade Dance, Azir and Aurelia clearly work together because of the free attacking. However, Azir also goes with Mona Shurima. So I have to make a distinction sometimes. Like, what does it look like Riot really tried to push with these decks, right? And I feel like with Azir Relia, that was more intended than Mona Shurima. Next deck is going to be Annie and Jin. This came out during World Walker, and this was supposed to be the skill deck and i don't mean skill as in like high skill to play because let's be honest it's a pretty easy deck it kind of plays itself it's just an aggro deck i want to say that this one is annoying but playable because i really enjoy the concept behind it even if i get blown out by an annie Jin, it's still fun to watch all those skills go on the stack and all the effects that annie and Jin create with like the lotus traps and the fire from annie it all just looks really cool timbers has a sweet animation too and i i don't want to ignore that right Jin is very unplayable without annie which is why you know well annie has seen a lot more decks than just annie Jin. i feel like Jin and annie were still definitely meant to be in the same deck sadly Jin was tried as a control champion but always failed it's never really been good it's been nothing but unplayable we saw some bandle city Jin, and that was still aggro right it wasn't with annie but it was still aggro so Jin is just meant to be the burn champion i don't really mind that i i think there was a lot of potential that's missed especially because every other champion that came out during world walker or even the darken expansion which was set five could have uh had a lot a lot of flexibility, but not Jin. Jin is the only one that didn't really have any flexibility. Okay, and then I'm gonna go to Jinx and Draven, a deck from all the way back, from back in Foundations. And this deck is still pretty much playable today if it wasn't for Draven getting rotated. This is, Jinx hasn't really, Draven Jinx hasn't really been outside the meta. It's not been like a high tier deck at all times, but it's been at least playable especially in like lower ranks or for beginner decks right in the highest tier yeah sure it's it's been gone but at that time either drave was good or jinx was good i i i'm putting this here it's like slightly below the middle because sometimes you play against this deck and they go to turn four and they have five units on the board because they're discarding flame chompers and jury rigs and they play a house spider and then they play their crowd favorite and that crowd favorite is like a seven six and if you don't play targon and you don't have an equinox you're just losing the game immediately and and nobody wants to see that right okay next up let's do zillion and zillion is this is not time bomb printer this is zillion echo 
And the deck that's described is Predict. This is a Predict deck. And the concept is simply, I'm shuffling powerful tools into my deck and I'm trying to fish them out of my deck by using Predict. By putting the right cards on top so I draw them. Think about Time Bombs. Think about Chrono Breaks from Echo. Think about the Hexite Crystal from the Cat. There's even cards like Xenotype Researcher, even though they're not played here. Was also like potentially really cool, giving plus three, plus three to your drop borders that also get summoned for free if you predict them. There's a lot of cool stuff here. However, it turned out to be nothing more than an aggro deck. The concept is awesome. Zillion is fantastic. But in, at the end of the day, it's just, uh, can you level Echo on turn four? And can you find Chrono Break? And I find that really, really disappointing. I'm giving it slightly below average, much, much like Jinx Raven, because again, I think the concept itself is pretty successful. It's just that the optimal way to play it feels pretty bad and shallow. Yeah, and with Voice of the Risen, it's also, yeah, it's just a go wide aggro deck and revive your stuff if you have to one combo piece. It's, it's boring. I think Echo deserved better, a lot better. The concept itself, it, if it was actually played with stuff like Xenotype Researcher, Secret Keeper, it would have easily been here, right? Because in that case, the frustrating aspect would have been, oh, they played Echo early and they instantly found a Chrono Break. That would be the frustrating aspect. But right now, yeah, no, not really. Surrender early to save mental because you get blown up by way too many things if they hit the right cards. All right, let's go to Forge. This is easily... Might have frustrating aspect, but cool. This is the Jax Orn deck that plays Jax on turn two, hopefully, and then start forging his weapon. This also plays Weapon Masters. So if you don't get Jax early or you can't level him early, you're playing Weapon Masters and you're using all your Forge cards on those equipments, giving them plus one, plus one. The minor frustrating aspect I'm talking about here is if the Jax deck has the, the one, two that forges the next ally you play, on turn one and then Jax on two and then another forge card or a weapon master on turn three if they hit that curve it feels impossible to deal with Jax because they have a four three quick attacker on turn two and that feels pretty bad to play against this deck has also just seen a lot of love in the current eternal meta it was very good right before rotation but with troll chant leaving the game it's been less good however I think Orin it's just a Giga Chat. Level Jax, his new looks, his voiceover is fantastic. I, I like having it around. I like having it be part of the meta because it is so different and unique for a mid range deck. Okay, this is a Bard Nora deck that I he have here with the chime. I know that Bard has seen play everywhere. So maybe it's a stretch to say that this is a pre build deck. I don't think it really is. However, because Runeterra printed the Mysterious Portal, which literally says plant a chime, and plant a mysterious portal. Feels like, you know, because it's synergized with both the champions, they at least somewhat meant for Nora and Bar to be in the same deck together. I find this deck very cool. I think it's not powerful enough to make it anything less than just having a few frustrating aspects, but maybe like annoying but playable if they high roll some boons with the portals or the chimes early, but that doesn't really happen. This deck really does need time to ramp up. They need to play their their chime generators early they need to play their portal generators early they need their more to stick around and if that happens yeah they get very powerful very fast but against most decks that doesn't really happen and then they start popping up like turn six where they just have more units with bigger stats than you and i i, I like that flexibility that playing the game depending on what unit you get playing the game depending on what chime the unit uh what chime lands on what unit very cool deck and i'm glad that in the nidalee nico expansion we got to see a well a nora support card a 3-4 that gives created units impact that seems like it'd be a good game finisher for this type of deck next we have evelyn evelyn is also a pretty flexible champion cc's plays with shadow owls however she was released an expansion with gwen and kaisa so evelyn kaisa feels like it was the intended way to play where the word to describe this deck is husks and keywords Kaisa needs a lot of different keywords. Evelyn gives a lot of different keywords. I think this one is annoying but playable. I could see people putting this in Surrender early to save mental. Because if there is a elusive or a spell shield chime, it gets very frustrating. 
I absolutely hate Kai'Sa with the Masha. It was a stupid combo deck that won on turn five every single time. They played units just for the keywords. But with Evelyn, I felt like there was a, a really interesting new direction for this deck that I really enjoyed. I always like decks that summon like a random keyword or a random unit. And then you have to find the optimal way to use that unit. That isn't really the case that much, which is why I'm still putting it like in annoying but playable. Because yeah, again, Spell Shield or Elusive or Overwhelm early on the right units gets very frustrating. But if you're the one playing it and you're like, oh, I got tough. Maybe I shouldn't play this unit right now, but this one instead. Maybe I want to use tough on my domination as an engine. Maybe I want to use... If I roll overall, maybe I want to save that one turn to give it to my Kai'Sa. Maybe I want to give Spell Shield to my Kai'Sa, but if I get Regeneration, I don't want that on my Kai'Sa, so I should play something else. And that that makes the deck really interesting to play. That's not really the case, because yeah, if you get a Husk on the board, you just want to use it as fast as possible. But the, the intention for this deck and the way it plays out pretty often is still really cool. Malphite to Leah. This one could also be considered a bit of a stretch in a way because we got Talia and then one expansion later we got Melphite. Maybe Talia was supposed to go with Lysandra, but Melphite obviously cannot be played with anything but Talia. So I'm still putting them together like this. Melphite to Leah goes to fun to play, fun to play against. Uh, number one, Chip is an icon. Chip defines what Runeterra is all about. Walk solid. I need the editor to put like some chip visual, some chip voice lines on the screen right now because that's really what this deck is. It's a chip deck. I will have to say, I will have to mention that right now, this is a bit of a high roll deck. Right now, this deck plays in a way where it's okay, they want to play. Ancient Preparation on turn 1, they want to play Rock Hopper on 3, they want to play the Dragon Roost on 3, they want to play the Salt Spire on 4, Talia on 5, and then Snowball the game. It, it's about hitting that early curve and then playing Melphite to lock out the game. That The deck is a high roll deck right now, all things considered. It plays very, very linearly, if that's a word, linearly. It's a linear deck, all right? It curves and it kills you because of it. Okay, and then we have Plunder. Now, if you ask me where to put this deck after and during Rising Tides, like during Targon and Rising Tides, I would put it here or here. At that point, the frustrating aspect would be, oh, they use Black Market Merchant and they stole a powerful card. Damn, that sucks. I'm playing a mirror. I'm playing a plunder mirror. And it's whoever plays Black Market Merchant and steals like more Black Market Merchants or more Pilfered Goods just wins the game. But right now, I'm, I'm putting it here. I don't think it's quite kill me for me. It's not quite the kill me tier because mm, I can't put this in the same tier of Playdance. There, there's no way. There is no way I'm putting that there. I, there is nothing quite on that level here. No, sir. Miserable, because it's, again, it turned into a super linear deck. They plunder turn one, they plunder turn two, they plunder turn three, they plunder turn four, they play Gangplank on turn five, they plunder, they hit you for a million, they play Sejuani on turn six, they lock you out. It's, it's miserable. I'm really glad that Gangplank got rotated because I was sick and tired of that play pattern. It, it's just, it only wants to do one thing. It wants to do that specific thing every turn. You get burned out, you get out aggroed, and then when they play their champions, which they always draw every single game, you lose to either one of them. Doesn't matter what you do. It's a shame because Gangplank is a really cool champion, but it's just been reduced to a, a sad, sad plunder champion that only does one thing. Puff caps. Can I get some opinions in the chat? Because this one is hard to rate. If you're the one playing it, it's probably up here. If you're playing against it, it's probably down here. Honestly, the idea of shuffling traps into the enemy deck, I think is genius. The payoff, the way you hit like a big red button with Karina to explode them all at once, genius. But it gets annoying if you if you see like all the streams go off at once and I get that. I'm going to put it at a... Uh, I'm putting it at minor frustrating aspects, but cool. Because the minor frustrating aspects is, oh, I lost to 20 shrooms. But the idea of that and the content and the high is so freaking well done. I, I understand, right? I think, for example, the Freljord version of the deck are much more frustrating than the Bandle City versions of this deck. 
but the the concept that we've seen in Hearthstone 2 with the bombs, we have Bomb Warrior, and that was entirely random. Like it's like okay, I either draw these bombs or I don't. I feel like there's enough cards, and it's balanced in such a way that this deck gets that big red button that they can press at some point and you know what's coming and you have to stop them from hitting your nexus from shuffling those rooms you can kill their engines you can kill their teemo and their profit cap peddler and that should be all you do that entire game if you don't have that answer yeah you're probably losing nightfall a very very interesting deck this is nocturne diana this is nightfall as the one keyword, the mechanic that describes this deck. This is not Nocturne Fearsomes. That was a very good deck near the end of, or right before rotation. Nightfall. Yeah, I'm, I, I, and this is the the second tier one deck for me. Now we have to talk about Melfi 2. This was a low tier one, high tier two deck at some point, right? Nightfall has been tier one, maybe high tier two, once for like a week maybe and besides that it's just been a copium deck ever since pill cascade got nerfed this deck has never been quite the same nightfall had all their good cards rotated too doom beast is gone stygian onlooker is gone unto dusk is gone it's uh it's not a very playable deck right now it's supposed to be an aggro deck but all those aggro cards are gone so what's what's left for this deck really i I'm not putting this here because it is a bad deck. I'm putting this here because I, I like that more thoughtful combo process that you enter when you play this deck. It's like, what should be the first card I play this turn to enable my Nightfall? If I play that this turn, how am I going to enable my Nightfall the next turn? That's that's how you need to think about this deck. And that's that's an interesting pattern, I think, for a deck. Has it been well realized? No, it could have been a lot better. It could have been done a lot better, as in there could have been better payoff. The champions could have worked together a little bit better. But seeing a level Nocturne and using like that effect to give everything minus one, Diana getting a lot of attack and that, that animation when she challenges something is gorgeous, man. It's so freaking well done. But it is a bit of a shame that all of their units are just about hitting the Nexus. Talk about Dragons. Dragons is arguably one of the decks that i will always enjoy playing it's one of my all-time favorite because i love aurelian soul i like big units i like celestials that you sometimes get in this deck now one thing i find frustrating about this deck which i can already tell you i'm probably putting it here the one thing i find frustrating is that when dragons were meta it was extremely difficult to play meme decks against them Again, it was extremely difficult to play anything but optimal decks against them. Because if dragons are tier 1, all their units... That means that all their units are slightly more efficient than yours. And then when they get cards like single combat, form up, and stuff like that, it's extremely difficult to get through that. To push through a deck that's overall good at everything. They get combat tricks, they get healing, they get stat buffs, they get a late game win cons they get card draw with chow at the time and that wasn't great if you had a deck that couldn't quite kill like one of their more powerful units that stuck around we've seen dragon decks in like pretty much every single card game you can imagine they're in hearthstone they're probably in Yu Gi Oh too they're in pokemon if you like cherry's art stuff like that but here it's it's more like about the space dragon aspect of it all, which I really enjoy. Targon has awesome visuals because sometimes you get the level Aurelian Soul. It makes it uh, it makes it always a cool deck. But if they are meta, which they were at one point, I believe it's over a year ago from now. I'll be completely honest. At that time, it was frustrating and made me a little bit frustrated with the deck. I was like, yeah, if I'm playing off meta decks, I don't really want to queue into dragons because I know they're going to outstat me and outvalue me and outheal me if I try to go for that win con. And that's frustrating if you're trying to make content. But besides that, just great archetype, great theme, very well realized in Runeterra. Love it. Next up, the Slay archetype. We have Kindred Nasus right here. I'm putting it here, which is going to be controversial. As much as I like the Slay archetype, 
I find NASA's to be extremely frustrating to play against. NAS has been bad. NAS has been way too good. Right now, he's way too good because of Vault. But when this deck came out, we had that triangle where it was NASA's Trash, um, which was a little bit better than NASA's Kindred, because I think Kindred was a 5-mana 4-4 four, four at the time. Then we had Playdance in a triangle and the Watcher. That was discussed in the last video, too. This deck, if you don't have an answer for Kindred, she absolutely rolls you. There is nothing you can do. I am used to playing Targon against this deck. I would play my Zoe on one. I would play my Aphelios on three. They would Valfeast my Zoe after they play Kindred, and then my Aphelios is dead as well, right? If I don't have an answer. And that is miserable. Always found this deck miserable, because no matter what you do, you could lose early game, you could lose late game. They always have an answer. Okay. Let's keep with that theme of Shadow Owls just removing everything. Darkness. This is really, really close to kill me. Really, really close. If there was a tier between these two, it would be there. I'm putting it here because I love Vagar. Vagar's voice lines, Vagar redesign, small redesign. The, the darkness, the concept that the darkness from Battle City is about growing the stats. The darkness from Shadow Owls is about reducing the no not reducing costs it's about using it in more unique ways like a fast speed like an aoe it was really cool and that's all the positives i i have to say about that really vagar cool the flexibility of darkness and the ways you use it cool like powering it up reducing the cost really really awesome but uh playing against it is absolutely awful it uh, darkness mana was one of the worst i've ever seen it's not even surrender early to a mental right but you will probably do that, because if they hit the 3-2, the Twisted Catalyzer on turn 2, and you can't deal with it, and they get a free Darkness, maybe two free Darkness procs, the game's over. You just lost. If they if they get two procs on Darkness early, this thing needs four damage. That kills your four costs. It sucks so much. And then you have Senna with the fast speed on slow spells. Like, how many times have you lost? Because Senna's on the board, you're trying to attack into her, and she just fast speed runates. Why is that a thing? Just play, just play Minimorph in this deck, man. Yeah, exactly. Again, the only reason it's not here is because the theme is really cool, but that's just not enough to save playing against it. Miserable, man. I want to like this deck so much because it's a cool idea, but getting all your stuff removed permanently until they can throw their removal at your Nexus? Nah, nah man. No. Nah, no, no way. Here's another one that's going to be very divided between the player base. Are we putting this near the top, in the top three, or the bottom three? Now, I'm the one making this tier list, and I'm going to put it here. I'm putting it slightly above the average, because even as a Pike enjoyer, I will say this for the 20th time, I main Pike in League of Legends. My second most played champion is Fiddlesticks, and my third most played champion is Rek'Sai as a jungler. Rek'Sai is probably my best jungler, and it has been for a very long time. This deck was made for me. It has two of my mains. So, of course, I like playing it. If Lurk had two different champions, I probably wouldn't like it. If, if, if Lurk was like an Aurelia Nami deck, I would hate it. I would absolutely hate it. But because it's two awesome champions and Pike's reveal trailer was one of the best trailers they've ever done because of the hype that it created. Just that voice line from Pike where he goes like, all the koi in the world won't keep them off my list. I love that. I get goosebumps every time he does that. It is so God damn awesome. It's one of the best realized deck archetypes I have ever seen in any card game. But that doesn't take away that sometimes they play a Lurker on turn 1 that hits Rek'Sai, they play a Snapjaw Swarm on turn 2 that hits a Pike, and then they predict into another Rek'Sai on turn 3, right? And then you lost the game. I'm not taking that away from this deck, because that is absolutely a possibility, and nobody likes playing that against that. Not even me. Not even me. That's the same as me being a big Pike fan in League of Legends, and like, oh my god, I'm playing Pike, I'm gaming, but then I play against the Pike, and they kill my team. Scouts! This is another deck that's basically been around since the start of the game. It's always been relevant. Maybe for the past six months or so, it's not been quite as relevant. But uh, this was one of the more successful archetypes that they created during Rising Tides. I find Misfortune to be a very, very good, simple, but well done payoff for attacking multiple times. I am putting this in yellow, yeah. 
Well, it's been too strong at some times. Well, it's considered a deck that's basically like, do they draw misfortune? It's still really well done with the attacks. It's uh, it's an it's it's a satisfying deck to play. If you get that misfortune and you get to attack multiple times, if you get to level misfortune, it feels really, really, really good. Misfortune yelling bang and love ya. Where you see that coin flip and land there when she's about to do her shots. The voice acting, the visuals, the Demacia units that attack twice, it all feels really thematic. And then we have Deep. I'm putting that straight at the top. Deep has been too strong. Deep has been too weak. But this concept, just like Scouts, is so unique. It's not going to be possible to have an archetype like this in any other game. It's a deck about tossing. It's about throwing cards out of your deck to get to that to get to that magic number 15, at which point all your small sea monsters get so close to the surface that they're all like really big sea monsters. You get Nautilus, the commander of the sea monster army. He, he, he plays them cheap, he eats your stuff, and he overwhelms you. It's it's wild to have two entirely different things come together like that. You have sea monsters, which are unplayable in any deck. They're terrible. They're understated. You have toss, which is a terrible mechanic. You're literally throwing cards out of your deck, but you put them together. You get deep and it's it's gorgeous. Now, I feel like Maokai. Maokai is a thing that should have never happened, but I'm not going to take that away from him. Maokai feels like it's... I'm not a designer, right? But Maokai feels so random to me. Why is Maokai in this deck? What, what does Maokai have to do with sea monsters? And why is he obliterating your deck? Why Maokai? I, it feels out of place, I guess. Like you, you look at a card like Zillion Echo, right? It's too, it's too time dudes. It's too time travelers. It makes sense. You, you see. Darkness, it's Vagar and Senna, they both use Darkness. Lurk are both two units that, like, that are like right around the corner watching you for the perfect moment to strike. Dragons, well, you know, <laughs> they're two dragons. <laughs> but Lurk, well, it's, just, it's, uh, it's an anchor and a guy in a suit and there's a tree. This one... Is a bit of a stretch as well. This is Zoe Victor. Both came out during the Cosmic Creation expansion, also released at the same time as Riven. And these three champions were all about creating cards that didn't originally start in your deck. The Augment keyword. And Zoe wanted to see 10 different cards. Now, creating different cards that didn't start inside your deck is very good if you want to level Zoe. Victor really likes those creative cards because he grows really big with good keywords. I'm putting this here, not because it's a personal favorite of mine, but again, because I think that the concept is just so amazingly well done. The whole celestial and invoke archetype really came together because they're also created units. I love this deck with all my heart, not just because I love playing it, but just because I love that it exists. I'm, put, I'm putting this to the front because this is this is one of my favorite decks all, of all time. This is this is this deck is what made me a card gamer. Scargrounds. Um, so this one goes into the light green tier because the frustrating aspect here is if I'm playing it and I don't draw Scargrounds, I have a miserable deck. If my opponent plays it and they draw Scargrounds on three, they have a very good deck. That, that, that's really all there is to this deck. It's an awesome concept. The self damage archetype is pretty well realized. I feel like a vampire sucking on their own units and then you have the scar archetype all about taking damage and becoming more powerful because of it it's it's well realized like the, the the theme i mean it feels great to play the units that are in it make sense they all feel like cohesive i think that's an important word that i haven't used enough cohesive deck is cohesive i feel that with scar grounds but the playstyle itself the payoff is yeah, not not great, honestly. It feels really weird. It's like if I'm damaging my own units and I'm playing as Noxus with Flock, then, you know, I just kind of die immediately. If they stun or remove my Vladimir or my Braum, I also just kind of lose instantly. And that feels really bad. The, the payoff of this deck and the way to win is either creating value 
from the Crimson Curator, like hitting him, and he calls more of his friends because he takes damage. It's Scar Grounds helping your units get tough and become really big so that you win more units or that you win more combats. And if you win more combats, your units become even stronger, letting them kill your opponent even faster. It's it, it's cool. It, it suits Freljord. It doesn't suit Noxus that well because their units are very disposable. It's uh, There's a lot of risk and reward because you need to damage your units to become stronger. So... That's that's why it's minor frustrating aspects. It draws car grounds and the slight misalignment of payoff. Yasuo. This is Yasuo Katarina, which is a deck that was definitely pushed in foundations and got a little bit of support maybe two years later in the form of the windswept swept hillock. This deck has never been good. It did win a seasonals once, which was because of the landmark. And this deck feels miserable to play against. Now, I will have to say, by reiterating, that this deck was never really that good for a long time. But it's still a deck that does nothing but stun you. Oh, you're trying to attack me? Stun. Oh, you're trying to attack me with one big unit? You're, you're all in on one champion? Never gonna happen. You're never gonna attack with a unit because I'm gonna recall you, I'm gonna stun you, and you can just hit that surrender button because you know, this, game, this game is over in loading screen. <sighs> Not many decks play that way. And that's probably why Yasuo Katarina was never a good deck. Katarina was also a pretty bad champion. But let's be honest. Nox is probably the region that got the most love out of any deck or any region ever with the cards that they got. They've always been great. We see the absolute rise to dominance of Katarina. That hasn't gone unnoticed by the developers either because he did get rotated. And then when Windswept Hillock came into the game, it was... It, I gotta say... The way it was designed was beautiful. Windswept Hillock was this landmark that not only drew your Yasuo, which is the most important champion in the deck, because if you're just stunning for the hell of it, you're, you're probably not going to win. But then, not only did it draw your champion, not only was it a boat, it also stunned when you got the attack token. Which, you know, is a consistent stun for Yasuo. You level him consistently. But also, when Katarina is leveled, and she levels by recalling, which helps level Yasuo, you also get that attack token, which means that Windswept Hillock starts stunning. So if you're playing against this deck after that card got introduced to it, you are looking at a deck that attacks you multiple times a turn and stuns your strongest unit multiple times a turn because of it. So if you're in combat against this deck, you're going to have a hard time blocking it, getting value against our units because Yasuo is a 5-5 quick attacker and Katarina recalls herself. That's... It's hard to deal with. They also have to play Blade Furler, which grows really big. You're unlikely to win combat straight up against them, right? And even if it looks like you are, they stun you. You lose combat. You summon another unit because your units either died or got stunned. And then they rally with Katarina with the Hillock on the board. And then your strongest unit gets stunned again. How? It's like, it's like an Exodia, almost. It's... It's a really, it's really strange how that came together. So while the card was designed beautifully, it hit all those perfect synergy points between Yasuo and Katarina. It was also just really strong and it felt awful to play against to so just not be able to ever use your units. It's a lot of cards to set it up. You need those specific units on the board and in your hand and it didn't have that much draw. So it didn't happen that frequently, but when it did happen, yeah, the game was over. <laughs> It was just over. Okay. Star Spring. Surrender early to save Mental for me. Because I like what they did with Heal Dex. I have a soft spot for Heal Dex. I, the first time I hit Legend in Hearthstone was with Paladin Heal. I used the Soup Vendor, which was a 2-mana 1-4. That said, whenever you heal for 3 or more, you draw a card. First time every round or something. It was something like that. And then I had cards like that said, if you've healed for X amount this game, give me plus four, plus four. If you heal for X, instead of summoning a 2-2, two, two, you summon a 4-4 four, four for two mana, no matter what it was at. And that was one of my favorite decks of all time. So I was really excited when I saw Tom Kench and Soraka. Tom Kench damages himself by eating units, removing them, and then Soraka heals him back up. And Soraka has to attack to heal something. 
They have Box to push damaging itself. The way to win with this deck was Starspring. And that means that sometimes you are playing against this deck and you can never attack into them because your units don't have enough power. So they will just block it. All you're doing is helping them get closer to their Exodia win con. And if you're playing against a deck with that type of playstyle, it's really, really, really miserable. Like probably more so than any time I've said miserable in this video. Because you have to realize that if you can't deal with Tom Kenj, if you can't deal with Starspring, you are going to get your units removed one by one while you see the Starspring tick up to 22. And then the game is over immediately. You either have landmark removal or you have a way to deal with Tom Kench. Because one way or another, all your units are getting eaten and you're losing the game without them even dealing any damage to your Nexus. And that's like, that's the worst combination, right, of things. It might even have to be lower because of that. Yumi and Pantheon. This is Faded. Where are we putting Faded? I, uh, this is, uh, if this is around the Zenith Blade days, then it feels miserable to play against. Because what this deck would do is they would create one really big faded unit. And then if you finally manage to remove that, they would just create another one. And they draw their Zenith Blade for free from their deck. They give it Overwhelm. And yeah, no matter what you did, you would lose. They either had like a big faded dragon early. They had a big Saga Seeker early. And then they move on to win the game with Pantheon. And of course, this was played in Demacia. So they rally too to attack with their really big dudes. And it's just, it's awful, man. This deck was absolutely miserable to play against. Nobody likes Yumi. Yumi is probably the most hated champion in all of League of Legends. And I feel like they captured that pretty well in Legends of Runeterra too. The concept of Faded is kind of cool. The whole, you're picking this one unit and you're turbo powering them up so they can become a threat. They can slay gods. Yeah, you know, with a cat on top of them. Yeah. It's cool. It just, it feels like they weren't climbing a mountain like the regular way with a rope and like some hooks. No, that's not how Pantheon climbs the mountain. Pa Pantheon has like a jetpack. That's how Pantheon climbs the mountain. It goes way too fast. It's way too easy. There's almost no risk involved. And, you know, even if one of them would have their jetpack malfunction, there would just be another one that rose to the top with another Zenith Blade, another really big unit that would just slam your Nexus for a million damage. That's, uh, that, that, that's how they do it. Next, Sivir and LeBlanc. The word to describe this is reputation. I remember when this came out, and I believe it was Alan who played this deck and got master with it. And then at the end it said like, yeah, this deck is okay, but it, it honestly, it's probably just a bad deck where I'm just playing it really well. And I was like, oh, wow. I wanted to try this deck to also climb with it, but it's, you know, if only Alan can do it, then I probably shouldn't even bother. Uh, I'm going to say annoying but playable. I feel like it was never quite good enough to be anything like in the bottom three. What What's annoying about this deck is the letdown of reputation. Like not only should Samira have been the reputation champion at that point and not LeBlanc, it's also the way that reputation was implemented. Every single reputation card is just, oh, I'm cheaper now. Oh, you hit reputation? All right, I cost two less. Oh, you hit reputation? Okay, you get to do this for one man instead of four mana. Stuff like that. That was all reputation was. It's just like, okay, my cards are now a little bit cheaper. And then you give that to a region that doesn't really draw cards. Like there's whispered words, right? But <laughs> that card has been played everywhere but reputation because reputation was just never good enough. But I don't want to put it any lower because it felt like a fair deck. I'm talking about how the archetype and the theme of it was just disappointing, but that's... That's not gameplay-wise, right? Gameplay-wise, it was a very fair, straightforward mid-range deck. And then I have Rumble Scion. Not Rumble Vein, not Rumble Draven. No, the way that this was intended to be played, released in the very first expansion of the Bandle City beyond the Bandlewood set, was with Scion. And this is a very easy one. This is a slam dunk. This is fun to play, fun to play against. Uh, there's a lot to say about Scion Draven, which was just a very aggressive deck that played Scion on 7 leveled and always lost or always won the game. You would always lose. You had Rumble, which was an all-in deck that would play with Demacia most of the time, where it's just about attacking with stuff like Cataclysm, Rallies. And then, yeah, a 5-4 with Quick Attack and Spell Shield is very hard to deal with. 
But if you play these boys together the intended way and you're creating these awesome mecha yordles, it is such a wonderful deck, man. I love it. Scion has this effect where if you discard him, you give your strongest unit overall. And I'm saying that because I feel like everybody forgets that. Who remembered that you can actually discard Sion to get an upside? Nobody, because you just want to play him on turn 7 to win the game. That's what Sion is for. But with Rumble, if you're discarding Sion with Rumble and you give that Rumble overall, he becomes a very real threat that will level up and create more Mecha Yordles. Rumble is, by himself is not a healthy unit. It's kind of not okay. Scion, same thing. With Draven, it's maybe a little bit too strong. But again, put them together, create some Mecha Yordles, have a fair, value-oriented, mid-range, beat-down deck. It all comes together, and it's a beautiful experience that I will forever love playing. It's a, it's a bit of a shame, really, that this whole archetype and the theme of the deck was that you have this Noxus side, which is all about getting discarded. You have the, the, the zombies that want to have like a second life when they're discarded. And then you had the Mecha Yordle side, the Rumble, the Battle City side, which was about discarding those cards to make, well, ma make their mechs, I guess. You're discarding junk to create their awesome machines that they go to battle with. The problem was that is that you really want to discard three with Rumble to give him Spell Shield, but you also really want to save stuff you can discard for your Mecha Yoda Generators. So it felt like the Champion and the Support were kind of fighting over the same thing, and they could never really agree on it, and it was always a bit of a mismatch. I'm, I'm a little bit disappointed that it turned out that way. It felt a bit anti-synergetic. But those are my ratings! Very evenly distributed. If, if we put like one more here, it would almost be like every single tier has five decks. That's uh, that's well done, actually. That's very, very balanced. Pretty unexpected, actually. So let me know what you guys think. Let me know if you agree with this list. I will have the link somewhere down below as well, so you can tell me how you would fill out this tier list maker. And yeah, if you if you guys like this on Twitch and on YouTube, let me know. I will do more. This is the second one that I'm doing. The previous one was just broken meta decks. And this one is pre-built decks. So let me know. And I will be making more. Take care.